Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to FBCI Huawei Digital Conference. Now let us begin our second session on synchronizing Southeast Asia's Digital Economic Strategies, MPAC, RCEP, and ASEAN Digital Master Plan 2025. This session will be moderated by Dr. Mulia Amri, the expert panel at Kata Data Insight De Center based in Jakarta. Dr. Amri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and welcome back to this second session where we will be talking about um, synchronizing Southeast Asia's digital economic strategies. To kick off this session, we would like to invite Her Excellency Lo Yen Ling to provide a keynote speech. Her Excellency Lo is the Minister of State for the Ministry of Trade and Industry, as well as the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth of Singapore. A very good morning. It is my pleasure to be speaking at the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, FPCI Huawei Digital Conference on Advancing Southeast Asia's Digital Economy, Trends, Potentials and Roadblocks today. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you my thoughts on how ASEAN's digital economic strategies and initiatives can boost the region's digital connectivity and integration. The focus of today's conference on the digital economy in ASEAN evolves salient and timely. The past two years have been very challenging. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose new and unforeseen challenges to countries all over the world. The ASEAN region is no exception. ASEAN member states continue to grapple with the global pandemic and fundamental shifts in the international order. However, Therein also lies tremendous opportunities. One key area is in the unparalleled digital acceleration we are witnessing today. Southeast Asia is one of the fastest growing internet markets in the world. Its internet economy is projected to reach 360 billion US dollars by the year 2025. The speed of digitalization has also increased exponentially during the pandemic. About 75% of the region's population is now online. This allows e-commerce to become a key channel for businesses to seek new growth opportunities and for consumers to better access digital services. E-commerce in the region is expected to expand even further. It is expected to grow by 18% annually from now till the year 2025 and from 120 billion US dollars to 234 billion US dollars. ASEAN must leverage this momentum to promote equitable and inclusive economic recovery, create opportunities for our people and position the region for longer term growth. Digital transformation and regional digital integration have been at the forefront of ASEAN's agenda in recent years. In 2019, ASEAN put in place the ASEAN Digital Integration Framework Action Plan as the overarching blueprint for advancing digitalization in the region. This is reviewed regularly to ensure that the initiatives are fresh, relevant, and continue to effectively address the needs of ASEAN member states. ASEAN also launched the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity Impact 2025. It identifies digital innovation as one of the five strategic areas to achieve the vision of a seamlessly and comprehensively connected and integrated ASEAN. Several digital economy initiatives were also announced this year. The ASEAN Digital Master Plan 2025, ADM 2025, and the Bandar Seri Bagawan Roadmap on Digital Transformation. At the recent ASEAN summits in October, our ASEAN leaders also issued a statement on advancing digital transformation in ASEAN, which affirms the region's commitment at the highest level to become a leading digital community. On the trade front, we reached a significant milestone with the signing of the 15-member Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership RCEP, agreement in November 2020. The e-commerce chapter of the agreement focuses on developing a conducive e-commerce ecosystem amongst participating countries. This will create new opportunities for our businesses 
and promote greater digital trade connectivity. We are very pleased that the RCEP agreement will enter into force on 1st January 2022. With these initiatives, frameworks and agreements in place, what can we expect to see in the near future? How will our businesses benefit? And what are the next steps for ASEAN in our digital journey? Let me offer three points that may help us along. First, ASEAN's digital economic strategies and initiatives represent our collective commitment towards becoming a highly integrated and cohesive ASEAN digital economy. ASEAN has many more digital initiatives beyond those I mentioned earlier, some at the broad strategic level, others at the sectorial or thematic level. These initiatives share a common goal, regional digital integration. These various initiatives complement each other and address specific needs and elements in ASEAN's digital economy agenda. For example, the MPEC 2025, ADM 2025, and the recent Bandar Seri Bagawan Roadmap on Digital Transformation each lay out ASEAN's focus to accelerate digitalization in different areas, from digital connectivity, e-payments, and cross-border data flows to interoperable digital tools and digital trade, among many others. Second, at the heart of the region's digital economy initiatives are the benefits we hope will accrue to the people and businesses in ASEAN, especially our micro, small and medium enterprises, MSMEs. For example, the MPAC contains a work plan to enhance the participation of MSMEs in the digital economy. Our emphasis on the digitalization of MSMEs is also reflected in practical initiatives such as the Online SMEs Academy and Go Digital ASEAN program. This helps strengthen digital skills and readiness amongst MSMEs to better position them to adopt digital technologies. ASEAN is also making concerted efforts to address the digital divide in the region through capacity building programs. This will equip people in the ASEAN region to better access the opportunities arising from digital economy. Singapore will continue to support these efforts with our fellow ASEAN member states. Third, ASEAN will continue collaborating and innovating to break new ground as we seek to become a single digital community. We must press on to establish robust digital trade rules, invest in digital infrastructure and connectivity, develop trusted data ecosystem and interoperable digital tools, including e-invoicing, e-trade documents, digital identity, and digital payments. This will facilitate the participation of our consumers and businesses, especially our MSMEs in the global digital economy. I am hence very glad that ASEAN has committed to address these issues via an ASEAN Digital Economy Framework Agreement. This will represent ASEAN's next level of digital integration and growth. ASEAN will need to progress our discussions to launch the Digital Economy Framework Agreement by year 2025. This will position the region at the forefront of adopting forward-looking digital rules to keep pace with rapidly evolving technology. ASEAN has made strides in our digital transformation journey thus far. We must continue to stay the course, draw on our shared vision of transforming ASEAN into a leading digital community and partner each other for win-win outcomes. Today, a variety of issues and challenges relating to ASEAN's economic development, particularly in the digital economy, will be discussed by prominent figures in our community. I hope you will find the discussions insightful and enriching. I wish you all a very fruitful conference. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister Lowe, for that very insightful keynote speech. I know three items that Minister Lowe has mentioned. The first is strategies. So we have the 
essential documents such as the MPAC, the ADM, as well as the Bandar Sri Begawan Roadmap. Second of all, we need to ensure that they provide these benefits to MSMEs and the people. And third of all, we need to ensure that further collaborations will be enhanced through trade and investment uh, opportunities. So to discuss these issues about the Southeast Asia's digital economic strategies and how we can further synchronize them, we have three panelists with us. First, I would like to introduce Mrs. Neti Muharni. She is currently Assistant Deputy Minister for Regional and Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation. She's based at the Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs, the Republic of Indonesia. Hi, good morning, uh, Ibu Neti. Good morning, Pak Mulia. Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you very much for being here. Second, I would like to introduce Mr. James Villafuerte. He is the Senior Economist for the Southeast Asia Regional Department based at the Asian Development Bank. Hello, Pat James. Hi, good afternoon, Pa Mulia. Good afternoon, everyone. Very nice to have you here. You are joining us from Melbourne. So it's the afternoon over there, uh, still morning in Jakarta. And third, we have uh, Mr. Andramika Priastio. He's the head of data science and advanced analytics at Bukalapak. Hello, Good morning, Pamulia. Uh, Andra. Hello, Hi. Pamulia. Good morning, everyone. Nice to meet you all here. Yes, nice to meet you all. So we have a great lineup of panelists with us. Uh, Ibu Neti, based at the Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs, she's uh, well-versed in various international, regional, and sub-regional economic cooperation, of course. Uh, she's, um, she has a master's degree in urban and regional planning. Uh, and uh, James Villafuerte, he's a, is an economist, he will provide an economic background. And Paandra, uh, being based at Bukalapak, one of Indonesia's um, major startups, uh, tech startups, who just went uh, public this year and is expanding to and expanding their business to other Southeast Asian countries, will provide the point of view of the private sector. So to kick off this panel discussion, I would like to invite Pat James first. Uh, let's talk a little bit about statistics, maybe some background, some quick backgrounds. Pat James, what is the current state of the digital economy in Southeast Asia? Thank you, Pat Mulia. Uh, really, uh, when you look at Southeast Asia, this is what we call the digital de decade. Uh, because of the pandemic that occurred last year, we have seen that the use adoption and trust of digital technology and digital platform has really increased and let us review some numbers prior to the pandemic uh, for example if we look at the b2c revenues for digital platform sales globally it reached around 3.8 trillion dollars which is around four percent of global gdp in our region in asia about 1.7 trillion b2c revenues from digital platform were recorded in uh, 2019, and that's equivalent to around 6% of our uh, GDP. However, for ASEAN, for example, in 2019, roughly uh, ASEAN uh, collected around 90 billion of B2C digital platform revenue. Now, pass forward to 2021, what we see in ASEAN is that this revenue from digital platform have increased to almost 170 billion. And it is likely to actually reach to almost 350 billion in 2025 and is expected to reach 1 trillion in uh, 2030. These growth are actually quite large. In our study last year, actually, even before the pandemic, we analyzed uh, a scenario where the digital, the, the use of digital inputs increased by 20% globally. And what we see from that exercise is that if, the, if digital inputs increase, by 20% globally, global GDP will actually increase by 4.3 trillion yearly, which is equivalent to the 5.4% of GDP in 2020. And for Asia, that growth will be equivalent to 1.7 trillion, uh, which is equivalent to 6% of GDP. And, and what happened is our scenario actually uh, happened because of the pandemic. Uh, and, and mainly, I think, uh, aside from the, the requirement to really minimize some of these uh, risks from pandemic, policy support for digital uh, platforms and for digital use was actually quite strongly rolled out during the last two years. 
Um, and, and the good thing with, with our region is, uh, in, if you look at the sectors, there are many promising sectors in terms of this digital app or digital economy. Of course, e-commerce is there, digital travel is there, digital advertising, and of course, one of the fastest growing sectors is actually food um, and, and, and travel. So, so and, and recently, with, with the advent of the pandemic, we also saw two new nascent sectors. One is actually ed tech, because there were lots of school closures, and we need to provide uh, services for education for our kids. And then the second one is actually telehealth. So what we see actually going forward is a very, very good prospects for the digital economy. One, because I think the number of digital users and the penetration rate, uh, as mentioned by uh, uh, Minister Lo Yen Ling for Southeast Asia is quite strong. If you look at the countries, I think that the top countries with digital connectivity in Southeast Asia is still Singapore, followed by Thailand, um, and then Malaysia and Indonesia, and uh, following behind is also Vietnam and the Philippines. So these big ASEAN economies have penetration rates uh, ranging from 97% for Sing Singapore to around 68% for, for, for Indonesia. So, so, so overall, even in terms of FDI inflow to, the, to this sector, in the first half of 2021, we have seen around 11.5 billion inflow into the digital uh, capital outlays for, for, for digital um, business. And this is again supported by the strong growth, the strong demand, as well as the strong regulatory support. Um, I will stop here, uh, Pat Mulia. Thank you very much, Pat James. It's very exciting that we see just uh, due to the pandemic that the, it has risen by almost um, double in ASEAN yes. uh, alone, right? So it, it hopefully it will provide uh, increased prosperity to everyone, including the uh, micro, small, and medium-sized uh, enterprises, as Minister Lo mentioned earlier. So it's it's a very interesting and exciting uh, opportunity as well. As you mentioned in Southeast Asia, uh, it's it's growing very fast. So I would like to turn now to Ibuneti. Um, Ibuneti, how digitally connected are Southeast Asian countries to each other? Of course, you're you're looking at it, this from a regional uh, trade, regional economic cooperation point of view. How digitally connected are Southeast Asian countries? But maybe not just from the economic point of view, but also people to people and political aspects as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Pa Mulia, and uh, thank you all, distinguished speaker, uh, this participant, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to answer how ASEAN digitally connected, actually, uh, well, ASEAN has been uh, working on uh, improving connectivity in recent years, including in digital uh, connectivity. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated uh, the digital, digitalization in uh, ASEAN, which highlighting the importance of the digital transformation to economic recovery and also growth. Uh, but James has already uh, briefed us uh, how that ASEAN has an opportunity uh, based on the statistic to leapfrog uh, to the front four in digital transformation. I think Pat James has highlighted that ASEAN has several key drivers in digital transformation. Um, the fast growing global digital economy, robust economic growth, and high number of population with digital literacy and fast growing smartphone penetration. To guide the region digital economy agenda, ASEAN has developed Ajita, uh, ASEAN digital integration framework and its action plan uh, at 2019-2025, enabling ASEAN to prioritize existing policy action that will deliver uh, the full potential of digital integration, um, such as uh, AC uh, Blueprint 2025, uh, ICT Master Plan, uh, Master Plan on um, ASEAN Connectivity as well, and ASEAN Framework for personal data protection, ASEAN strategic framework uh, for SMEs development, so uh, a wide range of uh, document that ASEAN has produced. So digital innovation uh, as one of the strategic areas in the master plan of ASEAN connectivity. Uh, in this case, ASEAN is working uh, to drive uh, digital development in Southeast Asia and strengthen connectivity among the ASEAN members 
through four initiatives actually related to uh, digital innovation, enhance the micro, small, medium enterprises technology platform. I think that is uh, very important things in ASEAN. I support the expansion of digital financial services so to make uh, more financial inclusion in ASEAN, open data, and also ASEAN digital data governance. Uh, outside the policy realm, uh, ASEAN has also successfully conducted ASEAN Council Day, I think, in 2020 and 2021, uh, showcasing uh, strong interconnectedness of digital economy player uh, in ASEAN. Uh, moving forward, ASEAN is on the right track to further strengthen the digital economy integration in ASEAN. Uh, through the development of uh, ASEAN Digital Economy Agreement, as mandated uh, by Bandar Sri Begawan Roadmap on ASEAN Digital Transformation Agenda. Um, in addition, there are also a number of digital development initiatives in the sub region economic cooperation, uh, which uh, the members of uh, this cooperation are also ASEAN member states. This sub-regional grouping position themselves as the test bed and a building block of ASEAN, such as uh, BIM IAGA. BIM IAGA is BIM uh, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, is ASEAN growth area. And then IMTGT, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand growth triangle, and also uh, GMS, Greater Mekong sub-region. So in this uh, sub-region, uh, many ASEAN initiatives are piloting in this sub-regional grouping. And uh, yeah, for uh, in Bimiaga, for instance, they are, they are working on uh, bridging digital divide, a number of hard and soft infrastructure such as uh, Wi-Fi hub, satellite, free broadband access are being established in Bimiaga rural areas to increase digital literacy and ensure electronic access to social services such as health, finance, education, as well as to promote e-commerce as well. Some other major projects, uh, such as submarine, optic cable, are also being established to connect the region with the rest of the world. And I think, uh, last but not least, I would like also to highlight Indonesia will host the 20 presidency for 2022. And one of the main agenda is digital economic transformation. As Indonesia also will hold a central in 2023. Uh, we could synergize this uh, deliverables of digital economy transformation in G20 to ASEAN as well. So I think the above highlight uh, hopefully uh, could give the, an overview on how ASEAN work on improving connectivity, especially digital connectivity. Uh, thank right. you, Pak Mulia. Thank you, Buneti. It's very exciting to hear all these um, different initiatives. And I I would like to also say that they were very concrete, yeah? Like uh, you mentioned about the Bimbiaga, about the laying out submarine uh, optic, uh, fiber optic cables. So ASEAN is indeed becoming more and more digitally integrated with each other. Thank you. I'm turning now to Mr. Andra Mika. Pa Andra, so going now to the private sector's role, um, of course, all these different policies and infrastructure, uh, it will have to be down to the private sector as well to integrate, make this integration happen. So what has been the private sector's role? Or for example, what is Bat Bukalapak doing, for example, for the development of a digital economic community or a digital economic market even in Southeast Asia? All right, thank you so much, Pamulia. So before answering that questions, uh, I, I just want to recap on how actually private sectors provide a, a value addition to the markets. So I'm not an economic expert like Pat James here, but we do know from elementary economics that a, a healthy market actually comes from a balanced kind of supply and demand. And having the private sector, it basically gives additional supply on top of what the public sector can offer beyond its capacity. And that essentially maintains the healthiness of the markets. So, um, and also on top of that, private sector has the benefits of operating multinational operations. For instance, if we can look in one of our day-to-day -day kind of examples, if you purchase automobiles, especially here in Indonesia, most likely it comes from like Japan. And given the RCEP as a starting point, as a free trade agreement, it gives us a, a better pricing and of course a better um, 
affordability to the goods and services across the members of RSA. So that's actually a good starting point to connect digitally across the countries. To portray a little bit more on how the private sectors have been adding value in terms of this digital economic community, uh, just to give an example, we do all know that COVID situation since early 2020 has been tough for everyone. But uh, given the private sector, there's been a lot of latest digital innovations that helps us to um, maintain the healthiness of the markets in various sectors. For instance, in education technology, private sectors enable uh, school from home. In wealth management, private sectors gives the options for investors to invest in, um, to basically maintain the value of their financial assets. And on top of that, uh, another example will be in consumer banking. It gives, it maintains the purchasing power of the consumers to, to ensure that the demand is still there. So that's a little bit of example in high level on, on private sector, but I'm not gonna move further in details in other segments. Maybe I can talk more about Bukalapak on what I know better, right? So in Bukalapak, um, as you all know, it's an um, all commerce platform. We're not only a marketplace, we also do have Mitra uh, solutions, which gives, which digitally enable the MS, MS markets in Indonesia. And we do know that these 50 million-ish MSME in Indonesia are actually the economic powerhouse, especially in Indonesia and also other Southeast Asian countries. And given this Mitra solutions that we provide from Bukalapak, we actually help them to also thrive through this uh, pandemic situation to also be, being and staying relevant and being competitive in the markets by digitally enabling them. For, for example, we give them access to uh, physical goods to restock their um, inventory. We give them access to selling virtual products like um, top up credit, uh, top up credits and Pulsa. And on top of that, we give them access to um, selling serf financial services for instance, um, fund remittance. And on top of that, we also give uh, other enablers such as productive loans for the MSME as the capital so that they can stay relevant and being competitive in the market. Right. So it's been, we've seen this uh, working in Indonesia and we've, we've gathered a lot of positive feedback directly from the customers. And we want to also test this idea to other Southeast Asian countries. And that's why yep. if you heard from the latest um, public uh, press release from Bukalabak, we're actually also expanding to other Southeast Asian countries. So hopefully Wonderful. that answers your question, Pamulia. Thank you. Yes, Pa Andra, thank you very much. It is also uh, very you know, uplifting to hear of these enabling role that the private sector is doing, driven by uh, market demands, for example, but also to solve the MSME's problem, enabling MSMEs to further access the wider market through digital means. Um, I would like to go to Pat James now. Of course, when we're talking about trade, uh, the supply and demand, we need to have kind of like a uh, and, and integration, a market integration requires some form of the players being uh, uh, able to interact with each other. So you mentioned earlier that there are some variations in digitalization progress uh, across different ASEAN countries. How would you address this disparity of capacities and progress uh, within the different countries of Southeast Asia in order to fulfill that digital market even faster? Thank you, Pam Molia. Um, earlier, I actually talked about the good things when we uh, talk about the digital economy. But as you all know, in everything, there's always the good thing and the bad things. And one issue with uh, Southeast Asia is despite this huge opportunity for business uh, under the digital economy, there are also many gaps and challenges in the region when it comes to digital economy. For example, one, uh, our access uh, to internet and uh, the quality of our ICT infrastructure are uh, price-wise, price it's quite expensive, especially in rural areas, there are poor access. And even uh, now when the demand for internet is actually quite high, ICT services have become unreliable. And I'm sure you would have experienced in some webinars, people will be sharing some video or PowerPoint and it would lag, no? Because the demand is so high. That's why uh, that, that is the first gap I think is in terms of uh, the needed ICT backbone infrastructure, and I think Ibonetti mentioned that. The second, the second gap actually, uh, Pambulia, is actually 
the deficient identification system and know your customer systems, which is very critical to ensure that digital economy is safe and that consumers trust that their data and their transactions are secure. And the third one is in most of the regions, especially the smaller ASEAN, there are also very limited digital payment options. Most of the payment options that we have in small economies are bank-based, but most of these MSMEs that Pa uh, Andra actually mentioned do not have any bank accounts. And then when you talk about uh, the ecosystem supporting startups, uh, uh, I think in Indonesia, Indonesia is actually Indonesia, Singapore is actually quite lucky because there are so many unicorns, no <laughs> digital company that uh, have capital of over a billion. But like in the Philippines, even with over 100 million population, we don't have even a unicorn, a single unicorn. Uh, I think even Thailand, I haven't heard uh, of, of a unicorn that's coming from Thailand. So, so I think the ecosystem to really support this innovation-driven entrepreneurship is also lacking. And then uh, on top of that, you have the digital divide. And then, of course, e-governance is also an issue. So I think to address these gaps uh, in the region, I think there are six po policy priorities. And the first one really is investing uh, to make sure that the quality and uh, access to ICT are affordable. And this is not just broadband or internet. This is also uh, including access to uh, middle, medium tech, uh, low tech technology. The second one is we need to broaden the e-payment systems uh, and provide availability and options. This is really good because I'm an old person. I'm a grandpa. I, would, I wouldn't reveal my age. No. And prior to the pandemic, I operate on cash. No? Because old people, we don't, we don't trust uh, digital payment. But when, when pandemic happened, I have no option but to shift to Gcash, uh, GrabPay, because it's so good. And, and now I'm not shifting back to cash. So, so I think uh, this payment is actually an enabler of the digital economy. And we need uh, the central bank laws to be revised to really support, uh, I think, interconnectivity between the di different digital payment companies, between the digital payment fintech companies and the bank so that consumers are able to use these payment options across different activities. And then the third one is on the education and training. I think especially in terms of our region, digital literacy and financial literacy are still quite weak. And access to uh, smart devices, especially for the poor segment of the population are still low. I think there needs to be a lot of intervention, even in terms of VEP, providing uh, digital training for workers is quite important. And, and right. last but not the least is really robust regulations to uh, prevent illegal activities, ensure that uh, personal data are protected because there are concerns about how the collection of this data can actually make us vulnerable to, to, to attack. So I'll stop uh, there, uh, Pamulia. Very much. Uh, thank you very much, Pa James. Uh, honestly, you look very young for a grandfather. <laughs> so well done on that. Uh, but yeah, so Pa James has mentioned six very strategic policy priorities. I'm still appalled that the internet price, uh, price of connectivity is still expensive. So now with this higher demand for it, uh, connectivity is indeed becoming more and more like a basic necessity. So we should, uh, like you mentioned, regulations to make it more competitively priced, but also to protect personal data and ensure cybersecurity. I would now go to Paandra. So uh, based on your uh, experience or, or the private sector's experience, what are the challenges of creating this digital economic inclus inclusivity? Considering the challenges that Pat James mentioned, what are, what are the challenges that the private sector has, has uh, faced and what uh, policy do you think are needed to advance the digital economy in the region? Thank you so much, Pamulia. So I can share a little bit more based on my experience. And as an additional context, before I joined Bukalapak, I actually spent a couple of years working in consulting firms as well. And I've worked with various and many uh, private sector clients in enabling them, especially in digital innovations. So typically, uh, the constraints in um, developing digital innovations, there comes to three things. The first one is capital, second is the regulations, and third is the labor. Or for the third one, we usually call it as talent. So in terms of capital, uh, we've seen that, um, especially for digital innovation, startups has been uh, one of the biggest driver in, in the uh, latest digital econ economic innovations. And 
specifically in Indonesia, we've seen that the growth of startups in Indonesia is actually uh, the fifth highest in the world after UK, US, uh, India, and so on and so forth. So to support and enable further this growth, um, giving sufficient capital is critical to basically unlock the additional value that we can get from this situation. And this can consist of uh, policies such as like uh, better accessibility of uh, investments, uh, like for instance, um, government grants for indirect investment as mentioned as well by Minister Lowe previously and so on and so forth. So that's one, capital. Second is more about regulations. So especially talking about financial technology or so-called fintech, it's, it's usually taking an extensive effort um, to getting it through the markets given the regulations requirement and so on and so forth. So establishing a better clarity and a more um, lenient regulation, it also can help to enable this digital innovation growth even further. So that's second, and this can be um, done on both national and international uh, basis. And the third one is of course talent. So talent of course is the key enablers as well to make sure that the digital innovations are growing at a healthy manner. Um, other than ASEAN um, countries, we also see a lot of uh, talents going out of the Asian countries. And it's hmm. usually hard for us to get these talents come back and, and basically enable our innovations here in ASEAN countries. So policies such as incentivizing local or even regional uh, talents to come back and basically build our countries here in ASEAN will be also beneficial for our digital innovations growth as well. So those three things are the ones that I believe is most critical to enable this uh, Mulia. Right. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm very happy to hear that uh, Andra's uh, answers are also in line with what uh, Pat James has mentioned about the you know uh, capital for investment and regulations, uh, as well as to provide protection and labor, which uh, 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 James mentioned about education and training. So I would like to give the final question before we go into question and answers to Ibu Neti. Ibu Neti, going back to the international cooperation framework, yeah, how do you see the existing ASEAN master plans and wider international agreements, such as the RCEP, the MPAC, ASEAN Digital Master Plan, as well as the uh, Bandar Sri Begawan uh, roadmap, how do, we, how do you see this uh, as advancing the digital economy? And do you think we could benefit from better integration or synergy between these policies? How do you see the road forward? Okay, thank you, Pa Mulia, for the very interesting question. Uh, actually, the nature of ongoing digital economy initiative in ASEAN, uh, such as e-commerce and uh, impact, and also e-commerce chapter in uh, RCP, uh, a synergy to each other. If we see that uh, impact uh, put a foundation, how digital innovation will shape ASEAN until 2025, while ASEAN agreement on e-commerce and also e-commerce chapter in RCP uh, give ASEAN member state ecosystem for development. So M uh, impact uh, 2025 actually support the digital transformation in ASEAN uh, through several means, uh, like uh, for its infrastructure development to ensure uh, seamless uh, logistics, uh, particularly for e-commerce, uh, digital logistic services are essential, uh, such as track uh, to trace, uh, meaning uh, and and to end visibility and also online information tariff and services, online contact and also customer services, warehouse management system, and also a payment. And also uh, development of a diagnostic tool to assess uh, MSME's digital readiness under impact 2025. So this tool assists uh, MSME's to assess uh, their uh, digital readiness gap in their adoption of digital technology and explore opportunities of the digital economy and plan their digitalization journey and establish a reliable user-driven data collection mechanism 
uh, to help policymakers also gather and assess the state of their digitalization uh, among these MSMEs, for example. So uh, it helped SMEs very much. And the next is the development of the ASEAN Open Data Dictionary for ASEAN Connectivity as the first initiative to support uh, open data in ASEAN. The projects aim to support ASEAN uh, member state in improving the efficiency of public service delivery, advancing the innovation and also uh, research of private sector and academia, as well as establishing the foundation uh, for the open uh, data network in the region. Uh, there is uh, also ongoing work to establish the ASEAN Digital Data Governance Framework that uh, aim to build the foundation to raise the digital competitiveness of ASEAN member states by establishing uh, the trusted, transparent, and equitable environment for doing uh, business. Uh, this initiative is really uh, of the ASEAN framework of digital data government uh, can benefit MSMEs in strengthening uh, their digital capacity. And uh, there's also a digital master plan that you have mentioned, uh, 2025, the new document uh, endorsed in January 2021 and began to be implemented in April 2021. Uh, some highlight of this uh, document first that the key role of the ADM, we call the, this master plan, is uh, to set in motion the work required to develop the digital uh, system, which are needed for ASEAN to participate efficiently in ASEAN trade agreement, including the RCEP. So such development should help ASEAN significantly in uh, its recovery from COVID-19. Right. And uh, do you want me to continue or it is enough? <laughs> I know, I think, that, I think that's, that's great, Ibuneti. Uh, I'm very happy to hear you mention that, you know, it's not just digital connectivity. We also need to have data connectivity, like you mentioned, ASEAN open data, and also the governance of this data, digital data governance framework, as well as not just the digital, but also the real world, physical real world that enables trade, such as logistics, warehouse management, as you mentioned, these are very important. And let's not forget that the digital aspects of trade is very much linked to the physical aspects of trade, like logistics and warehouses and tariffs, like you mentioned. So very good. We have we have several questions already. And uh, um, looking at the actually we have questions. The committee has uh, selected a few here. Um, actually, one of the each of the participants will have one question. I will start with the question for pa James first. This is related to, uh, I think, infrastructure uh, as well. So it would fit uh, perfectly with your role at the Asian Development Bank. Mm. It's a question is from Satrio Santoso from Indonesia. Uh, his question is about how to deal with this uh, gap in digital connectivity, particularly between urban and rural. Thank you, pa, yeah. thank you, Pamulia. Uh, this is really yes. uh, the, the, the key question when you talk about digital connectivity because uh, the gap in terms of rural and urban access is quite wide. And we know from our experience, especially for big countries, that uh, we need to provide uh, internet connectivity to rural areas to give them access to this big opportunity from digital data. I think there are basically... Uh, three things that uh, can be done on the regional level. I think development uh, partners should really work together to provide the money to, for, gov for countries to, to, to make this investment quite uh, safe and also commercially viable. I think these are large investments uh, in terms of FDI. Investments on telecommunications is quite important. And sometimes the problem here is actually the regulatory uh, space uh, because as we all know uh, telecommunications in most countries some, some of them are actually protected industries because they have national security consideration so I think we need to uh, change our policy and regulatory setting so that investments in this uh, core infrastructure is quite important but, but the other side is we should also focus on low technology which can actually provide uh, connectivity, but in a different sense. Like for example, in China, they've used QR code as a mechanism to deliver some of this uh, financial inclusion. So even in countries where you don't have access to the internet, 
but you can actually send uh, the QR code. They can actually uh, provide some financial services. I think the second part in terms of accessing, uh, in, the, in terms of addressing this gap between the, the urban and, and, and the rural uh, is really uh, dispersing uh, the location of business. Uh, I think it's good that in Indonesia, you are now planning to shift the capital uh, to, to a different uh, area. And, and, and this is part of urban planning. I, I'm, I live in Melbourne. Uh, I've been in Melbourne for over 15 years. And when I was in the treasury, one of the key reforms that we are doing is actually developing secondary and tertiary cities. Because our de development pattern in the region is actually highly concentrated. We're in, in the key cities in the metropolis, 70% uh, or 80% of the GDP are actually produced. What we need to, to do is actually to devote this business and develop secondary and tertiary cities. It's, it's good in terms of protecting the country from disasters because just imagine uh, a disaster hitting, say, Metro Manila, where almost all infrastructure and business are located, right? So, that, so even from, from a diversification point of view to address the increasing cost of natural hazards that may occur, it's actually good. And then second is actually uh, also addressing the cost of uh, rising land in, in some of these key cities. Um, the, 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 other, the, the other thing as well is, I think uh, the role of e-governance is also very important, uh, Pamulia, uh, because e-governance, uh, basically uh, the government adopting the digital uh, standard in its operations uh, from procurement to budgeting will actually help us prioritize uh, the allocation of budget across the different um, uh, subnational ju jurisdiction. Uh, I'll stop from here, Pamulia. Thank you very much, Pa James. I think it's very important that you mentioned about the, the key role of regulatory aspects to foster more investment uh, in the telecom sector so that they reach out to more than just the major cities, but also the secondary and tertiary cities. I think we know that in many countries in, in Southeast Asia, our primary city is, is basically where most of the population lives. It's the same case in the Jakarta metro area, the Manila metro area, you know, uh, even Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur, uh, where most of the people and the economy is circulating in the, in the main primary city. So there's a good point. The second question, I would like to address to Paandra. Paandra, this question is from Abigail. So she's apparently your uh, follower. And she uh, has a question about how do private deal uh, with these different uh, challenges of policies that you encounter in different countries? Sorry, Pamulia, you are breaking up a little bit. Can you repeat oh, okay. the first part? Yeah. Let me repeat the question. The question is from Abigail and she's asking how does the private sector deal with the different challenges, uh, the adversity of challenges from different countries? How do you deal with po different policy challenges in the, in the, the countries that you work in? Mm, okay, so specifically talking about changes in policies across Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and especially in Indonesia, uh, we do, work in adaptive manners, uh, meaning we always um, make ourselves updated on what are the latest changes. And of course, uh, especially in digital innovations, you do have this culture of working in agile manner. So that enables you to react to changes, meaning when you develop certain products, you don't uh, set the requirements cast in stone. So you let the products also adapt based on the changes in situations. It can be consumer needs, it can be regulations, it can be policies, it can be um, capital allocation and so on and so forth. So by adapting this agile methodologies of working, we, uh, it enables us to basically um, react to uh, changes, especially the short-term one. Um, and just to give you a little bit of example on how this works is that we basically, um, revisit the requirements every now and then to make sure that our product stays relevant to the market, it stays relevant to the, to the changes in policies, and it stays relevant to uh, the capital allocation as well. Um, so, so that's, I believe, the most criti critical aspect uh, to ensure that we can react to certain changes in situations, including the changes in policies. 
those are very important points that you raised, Andra, because being adaptive is something that is key nowadays. Not only the private sector needs to be uh, adaptive to the different regulations uh, within each country, but also the government needs to be adaptive as well with the fast pace in the change in the progress of technology, of society, and how technology changes society. The government must also be quite adaptive in, in changing its, uh, its regulations so that they are more up to date and closer working uh, mechanisms between the government and private sector will, of course, help to ease out that uh, adapt, uh, adaptability between both sectors. Okay, and I have a third question now. The third question is rather uh, difficult and the most appropriate uh, person to answer this, I think is Ibu Neti, but I will also open the opportunity for, uh, you know, for Pat James as well to answer if you wish. Ibu Neti, the question is from Mukhtar Ahmad. And the question is, is it possible that one day ASEAN economic community uh, adopts a single currency for for the uh, for ASEAN, maybe similar to to Euro. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you, Pak Mulia, and thank you, Pak Mutar, for the question. I think it is a very very interesting question, and it has also been in discussion uh, among ASEAN member states about uh, how possibility that we adopt the the single currency. But of course, that at the moment, uh, we are not uh, heading to that. Okay, uh, I think in ASEAN, uh, from external ASEAN, there are two questions uh, always asked uh, to the ASEAN. First, a uh, single currency, and second, a single union. So this is what people also ask. So uh, uh, for, uh, for these two, of course, that for the single union, uh, it is still far from uh, 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 what we call that uh, for ASEAN, so because ASEAN is uh, uh, very much uh, comfortable with the ASEAN security that we are uh, uh, adopt at, at the moment. And for the single currency, actually, uh, in bilateral, actually, uh, uh, what what we are doing in ASEAN now is that the 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 uh, swap the swap uh, 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 initiative that. Uh, uh, for example, virtually between Indonesia and ASEAN, so we we use the ex, uh, the the local currency exchange um, uh, in in uh, you know in business, for example, and uh, then this also um, um, also we use that uh, in several bilateral um, uh, in ASEAN member state. Okay, so but this. Uh, uh, in ASEAN, and we also um, use this uh, scheme in, uh, for example, for the ASEAN first three. So this initiative also uh, very much discussed and have been applicable in, but uh, of course still in the bilateral basis. So the question now is: Is it possible for ASEAN to uh, uh, adopt the single currency uh, at the moment? Uh, we are not uh, uh, discussing about this at the moment. Uh, so still, what we are discussing is about uh, how that uh, we could use the local currency uh, to uh, what we call to reduce the demand, for example, uh, uh, the uh, dollars, for example. So that also will help our businessmen very much. Uh, in, in uh, the crisis, for example. So I think that is right. my answer. Uh, Maria. Right. Ibuneti, you answered that very well, and I think it's clear. And I have one last question, and but we only have one minute left. So uh, this question, I think, is most appropriate for Pat James, and I'll keep it very short. Pat James, can the digital economy, can digital technology bring up ASEAN to be the next regional giant like the EU? Thank you, Prabhupada Pamulya. Uh, certainly, the opportunities from uh, the digital economy is quite big. And ASEAN is actually front and center in terms of the digital platform competition. If you look at all the technology companies, all the technology companies are trying to get hold of our market. And, and that one, one, one reason for that is uh, the number of internet users in our region is quite high. Uh, I think the latest estimators, there's about 440 million internet users. 
and about uh, eight out of 10 of that are actually digital consumers. So from the point of view of technology companies, um, these are actually uh, uh, potential demand. The second is, if you look up the per capita spend of our digital consumers, their spending are actually quite low compared to the spending that we are seeing in the US and, uh, and EU. So most of these technology companies are seeing, wow, you have this region with a huge number of digital consumers. And the level of expenditure of these digital consumers are still low. And we know from projections that the size of the middle income in Southeast Asia will grow in the next uh, nine to 10 years. So certainly I think this digital uh, economy is actually a good stepping point for uh, the sub-region to actually leapfrog into the development process. I wouldn't say we would be able to reach the EU level in terms of per capita income. But I think we can leapfrog. Why? Because one, it actually enhances uh, our processes. It actually increases labor productivity. Second, it, this digital technology actually allows us to address some of the geographical constraints. Like, for example, you don't need to pass through customs, which, which, which is inefficient because digital actually travels over, over the cloud. So there are actually some advantages because we know for example, in customs, there's a lot of corruption in terms of uh, extra pay, right, when you're shipping. But the digital actually bypasses some of those trade distortions and, and trade hurdles. That's why I agree that uh, it's really a big opportunity uh, for us to leapfrog with, with this digital economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pa James. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our session. It's been a, it's been a great and very insightful topic that we are discussing here. And I'm very happy that that final question that was answered by Pat James is actually, actually ends this discussion on a very enthusiastic note that ASEAN can leapfrog many constraints by using digital technology uh, to its full potential. And we've seen it happen. We were uh, previously you know, one of the regions with the lowest bankability rate and, you know, with very few payment options and much less online payment options, but with the advancement of these financial technology, as well as others, um, including electronic health, uh, e, you know, ed tech and all that. So we are expanding the services to more and more people, not just in urban areas, but also to the rural areas. And with that, if we keep uh, going on the right track, we will be able to leapfrog many of the constraints and possibly become one of the world's uh, strongest um, regional associations. So thank you very much for joining this session, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank uh, Pat James, Ibuneti, Pa Andra for joining us here. And hopefully you all have a great day ahead. And I will hand this back to uh, FPCI. Thank you very much. <laughs>